grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, today, as you noticed by the green pyramids, today we enter into the Trinity season. And with our gospel text this morning, it's very tempting to get the emphasis on the wrong syllable, to think that those who are rich will never inherit the uh, and, and inherit rather eternal life, and the poor always will. That is, the rich capitalists who are evil, and the poor blue collar workers are the ones who are righteous. But as you know, fine clothing and living high on the hog do not condemn a person to hell. And an empty wallet is not a ticket to heaven. There will be plenty of rich people in heaven and plenty of poor people in hell and vice versa. So we have to ask the question, what is our Lord's point in telling us this story? Seemingly without preface or explanation, Jesus speaks about a rich man of which in the text we don't know his name. Church history calls him Dives because it is the Latin word for rich. Again, the scriptures do not name him. He's named eternally for what he loved, that being his riches. And get this, no one remembers his name. Dives, though, as church history calls him, he had a very good life, handmade suits, custom tailored shirts, a daily menu rivaling a five-star restaurant, along with a portfolio to bankroll the whole operation indefinitely. Everything for him from the world's eyes looks wonderful. He was a man who lived chiefly in the pursuit of pleasure without showing an ounce of compassion towards his fellow man and oblivious to anything that was spiritual or eternal. You know, in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon tells us to go and to eat our bread in joy and to drink our wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. He tells us to enjoy life with our spouse, considering all that we have as being gifts from him, the food we eat, the property we own, the family we have, the health we possess, they're all gifts. And we're not worthy of any of that. No matter how big or how small, I've often thought to myself, God did not have to give us taste buds. Everything could taste the same. It'd all just be mush or bland. But he doesn't, even down to our taste buds because he's a good God and he gives us gifts and we enjoy the things of life that God gives us. However, things go wrong very quickly when we turn our eating into gluttony or when our drinking becomes drunkenness. Everything gets perverted when our clothing turns to vain glory. And our love turns away from our neighbor to what we possess. And this is part of the sin of Dives. Wasn't his clothing, his money, and food, but rather he made an idol out of his belly, and out of his desires, turning in, as the reformers spoke of, turning in upon himself. And as a result, it became blind and deaf to God and his neighbor, which is nothing more than vanity. Now, I know, uh, stop your sermon clock for just a second. I know that you think that we will never get out of chapter 1 in the book of Revelation. I get it. I get it. But you know one of those churches where Jesus comes to and he says, you've lost your first love. You remember this? You've lost your first love. The first love is loving God 
and loving neighbor. They're together. Loving God, loving neighbor. So like him, you too have been consumed with yourself at times, failing to help those who are in need, failing to help those whom you are to love. And this is why the very last prayer that we pray in the divine service is, we implore you out of your mercy that you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. And that is how we depart when we do divine setting three. Praying to God that we not be like Dives. So in contrast to him, outside the heavily guarded gate of his chateau lay a man whom the scriptures does name. It's Lazarus who rummaged around when he could in the garbage. A man who lived chiefly in the pursuit of survival. Whereas Dives is covered with fine linen, Lazarus is covered with sores. Dives belches because he's eaten too much. Again, Lazarus is soothed to sleep by the grumbling sounds of his stomach. Dives is surrounded by the comforts of life. Lazarus, though, is surrounded by dogs who lick the pus from his wounds. Dives, boy, he is a winner in the eyes of the world. He's a proud who's who in society. Lazarus, though, what a pathetic loser. You know, in Jesus' day, many, including the religious elite, they would have believed that Dives was blessed by God because Crying out loud, isn't it obvious? Riches and prosperity were signs of God's favor. But poverty and affliction and suffering, those were the signs of God's displeasure. Evidence that a person was cursed, lost, miserable, and forgotten by God. I mean, this is, this is one of the big points of the book of Job. Job's friends who come to comfort him basically saying what? You have been abandoned by God. And Job saying, no, I haven't. I haven't done anything wrong. And the friend saying, look at you. Isn't it obvious? This whole thought process, it might be true if you only look with your eyes, but it is our ears that must do the seeing. Lazarus knew the love of God above everything else, even above the things that he felt, the things that he saw, even the things that he suffered. For example, hungry, Lazarus believed that there was a better food than this rich man's leftover scraps. Lazarus collapsed outside of the gate he believed that he would stand before God one day, the God who loved him, doing so in the judgment. Covered with sores, Lazarus believed in the healing of his body and his soul that only God can give. And although dogs surrounded him on earth, he believed that one day it would be angels and archangels and all the company of heaven surrounding him for eternity. And so it is with all those who believe the promises to know the love of God. What we see is a man covered in sores, but Lazarus, beloved, he is decked out in the righteousness of Christ. He is clad head to toe, soul and flesh, with the body of the crucified, living on the bread that comes down from above, the heavenly cuisine of the word that comes from the mouth of God. The true rich man in this story is Lazarus. But the scene is about to shift to life beyond this veil of tears. But before it does, both men die. For death is the great equalizer. Why does death come? For all have sinned and sin's wages is death. Lazarus' destitution may have hastened his death, no doubt, but the other man's wealth certainly could not prevent it. 
death comes for all. But note the difference. At the death of the faithful, Lazarus, this is beautiful, is carried away by the angels. Whereas the faithless, it simply says, he's buried. It's like the angels don't even want to touch him. He goes straight to Hades, which is a place of torment and separation, nothing more than the devil's graveyard. And even though the world denies a place like this even exists, and it just carries on as if it does not, it indeed does exist, prepared for godless unbelievers. And so where do these angels carry Lazarus' soul? To paradise what we generally call heaven, where after the hard and painful life that he had just left behind, Father Abraham embraces Lazarus with a hug. I wonder when's the last time he'd ever felt anybody touch him. Thus poor Lazarus is now rich Lazarus. His soul is at peace. He's not afraid anymore. For as we heard, perfect love casts out fear. Lazarus now basks in the untold riches of heaven, resting comfortably in God's presence, along with all the saints, all the righteous who had ever gone before him. However, over in Hades, it is a completely different story, is it not? It's even actually somewhat painful to consider. Let's just say the accommodations in Hades are well below what Dives was accustomed to. Can you believe it? Abraham and Lazarus, they can be seen chatting with each other over in paradise. Supposedly, those in Hades, they can see what they're missing out on. The great wedding banquet, which forever eludes them, it, it's part of their punishment for rejecting the gospel in their earthly life. And so Dives, he cries out for Abraham to have pity on him and to send Lazarus to give him the tiniest comfort in this infernal heat. Think of that. This man still thinks of himself as one who could command lackeys. Like Lazarus to fetch him drinks like Isaac on the love boat. Abraham, though, carefully explains the realities of the situation. First, Dives, you had a whole lifetime's worth of good things while Lazarus was up to his eyebrows in misery. Second, just in case you haven't noticed, things have reversed. Third, between where we are and you, there is a great gulf that is fixed. Lazarus can't come to you, and you cannot come to us. You know, truth be told, the only person who would ever cross this chasm, this gulf, from paradise to Hades, is Jesus, who we confess in the Apostles' Creed descended where? Into Hades. But even then, he didn't stay very long. So upon hearing that there would be no cocktails brought over by Lazarus to die these, his thoughts turned to his five brothers. What do you know? He finally, finally thinks of somebody other than himself. But boy, it takes him being in Hades to do so. His brothers have got to be warned. Warned that spiritual things matter while one lives. That love to the neighbor matters. Warned that there aren't multiple destinations. There is no reincarnation. There are only two eternal destinations. And warned that this eternal destiny, this one called Hades, is not where they want to wind up. This makes me think about my uncle who about a year ago 
was on his deathbed. Doctors told him, we've done all we can do. You've only got like six weeks to live, and so you need to get your affairs together. I went over to see him. This is, this is a man very much like Dives. My uncle was the very first salesman who sold a personal computer east of the Mississippi River. He was a very, very wealthy man. He asked me, he said, do you believe in reincarnation? I said, no. The scriptures make it very clear it is appointed unto man to die once. He said, after I die, when you die, will you come get me and take me where you are? said, Uncle Pat, that is above my pay grade. But I can tell you right now how you can be where I am. I shared with him the gospel. And he said, that's enough talk for now. And he died. Diabetes. Part of the punishment of Hades is warnings that are made from there are useless. There's no cell connection in Hades. Just think of all of the cries that the faithless make from there. Most likely my uncle included. Who hope to warn their loved ones yet still alive, yet their cries cannot be heard. Why not? Because that is not what God has ordained. God has not ordained you to hear sermons from the damned. Except this guy. This is the only one you get. For God has ordained you to hear the sermons from His pastors, whom He sends you to warn now, while you live, warning you about your eternal damnation apart from Christ. Pastors who preach how in love God sent His Son to be the Savior of the world who suffered physically as well as suffered spiritual torment far beyond what Lazarus ever knew. God the Son who knew the disappointment of coming unto His own when His own received Him not and the scourge that brought Him sores which made Lazarus' sores seem almost merciful. Yet, Laz yes, Lazarus hungered but Christ fasted for 40 days and nights in the wilderness, and when he was tempted to turn stones into bread, he would not eat the crumbs of the devil. In that same temptation, the Lord rejected more power and riches than Dives ever dreamed. Dives begs in torment for water, but it is Christ who in torment suffered thirst that was not quenched, enduring the suffering and the scourging heat of Golgotha and the blistering wrath of God. On that cr cross, Christ thirsted so that you might be able to drink from the river of life. He was stripped so that you might be clothed with the garments of salvation. He was crowned with thorns that you might escape the curse of Adam. He was the Lazarus that traded places with all so that you might not come to this same place of torment. This place of torment, as Revelation teaches, this place of torment was created for the devil and his angels. Not for you. But sadly, there will be people who go there. And just like the rich man, Christ died and was buried and placed, as the Bible says, in a rich man's tomb. So living under the wrath of God and considering his brothers having to endure the same, the appeal is made to have Lazarus rise from the dead and then schlep off all over the Middle East, ringing doorbells, delivering what amounts to singing telegrams, lest his brothers die in vain too to suffer God's wrath along with him. Dives actually thinks, if a dead man, comes back to life. That'll jar his brothers out of their apathy, out of their idolatry, and out of their impenitence. I mean, seeing is believing, right? 
No, it's not. When Abraham speaks this time, he delivers the punchline. They, your five brothers, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them, your brothers, hear them. That is what they need. Law and gospel, if we were to put it in Lutheran parlance. By the way, it's what you need too. You need law and gospel. It's what everybody hear the law of God recorded in the Holy Scriptures and to let it have its effect. Moses and the prophets reveal how sin entered the world through Adam and that all men born of Adam are born in sin and subject to sin's curse, which ends in death. But not only that, Moses and the prophets, they call everyone to repentance, to look to God for mercy. Not because it's deserved, but because of the merits of Christ Jesus. Again, let me, let me hit this point again. Lazarus' poverty was not the ticket to eternal life. Lazarus had Moses. And he had the prophets. And he believed them, trusting in the promises of God, committing his cause to a merciful God in spite of a difficult life, which meant that all of the treasures of God belonged to Lazarus. God's name, God's kingdom, God's life, God's gifts, God's promises, God's heaven, all of it. And that, beloved, is the difference between eternal torment and everlasting peace. This life is the appointed time to hear and to believe, to confess your sins, to look to Christ, and to receive forgiveness. This life is also the time appointed for showing compassion, to lift up your eyes and to see the ones who've been laid at your gate, quite possibly, and to do what you can for them. Boy, after Abraham speaks, die these protests. No, Father Abraham, that is not going to work. You don't know my brothers. They don't go where Moses and the prophets can be heard. They don't attend church. Who does that? They need something else, Abraham. Something more. Again, like somebody rising from the dead. I am telling you, I know these boys. That will work. Abraham responds, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone should rise from the dead. But actually, somebody did rise from the dead, didn't they? It's the same one who's telling this story rose from the dead. Beloved, you have the promises of Moses and the prophets. You hear them, and through the Holy Spirit's work, you believe. Because you cannot by your own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But it is the Holy Spirit who calls and gathers and enlightens. Even in the midst of your difficult life, you see nothing but Christ and Him crucified and risen for you. And since you believe that Christ rose from the dead, so you too will rise. He, Jesus Christ, is the firstborn of the dead, meaning that others will follow in His wake, which is you. What Dives begs for but can never have you are freely given because you receive mercy, God's mercy for you in Christ. And you kneel and you receive more than crumbs. Yours is the bread that is the whole Christ. And the one who defeated death and rose now comes to you and the blood that he brings giving you life, eternal life, the forgiveness of sins. You taste here the feast that Lazarus ever enjoys as he now rests inside the gate, the gate of heaven, the exact same place that God has prepared for you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand together. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us pray now for the whole church of God.